Welcome to You Are Not A Frog, the podcast for GPs, doctors and other professionals in high stress jobs. Working in today's pressured environment, you may feel like a frog in boiling water. Things have heated up so slowly that you might not have noticed the extra long days becoming the norm. You've got used to feeling constantly busy and often one crisis away from not coping. Let's face it, frogs only have two options, to stay in the pan, be boiled alive, or to hop out and leave. But you are not a frog, and that's where this podcast comes in. You can do more than just hop out or burn out. There are simple changes that you can make which will make a huge difference to your stress levels and help you enjoy life again. I'm your host, Dr Rachel Morris, GP, turned executive coach, speaker, specialist in workplace resilience and creator of the Shapes Toolkit training programme. In the podcast, I'll be chatting with friends, colleagues and experts, all who have an interesting take on this stuff, so that together we can take back control and thrive. If you want more resources, including CPD reflection forms for the podcast, then make sure you've signed up to the You Are Not A Frog Collective and please share these podcasts with anyone who needs them. Before we get on with the episode, I'd just like to let you know that today is the last day for signing up to my Resilient Team Academy membership for busy leaders. Now, this is for you if you are a leader in healthcare in any way, shape or form. You might be a consultant running a busy department or having some mentoring or supervisation uh, responsibilities for trainees. You might be a GP uh, looking after people in your practice. You might be a team leader in a in another part of primary or secondary care you may be in another high stress organization and be responsible for one or two people or for, or for a whole team of people and you may just be managing people as part of your role but you have you know your day job that you have to get on with as well and you know that you need to support your teams for resilience productivity and well-being and you want some quick and easy tools that will help you take a coaching approach and have better conversations So the Resilient Team Academy is a subscription membership which will give you the full Shapes Toolkit training core content and every month you'll get a deep dive webinar, you'll get a coaching demo, you'll get a short bite-sized activity to use with your team, so a little video and a little team resilience building activity that you can use in meetings. There'll also be live Q&A and a Facebook group. So this is the last day that you can sign up at this ultra low launch price. We're not going to be launching again till next year because we'll be taking the cohort through the membership. And there is a 100% money back guarantee. So you've got nothing to lose. So why don't you try it out? It's the best way to uh, work with me and learn all about the Shapes Toolkit and use the full Shapes Toolkit resources. If you're listening to this after the 22nd of September and you'd like to know more, then do sign up for the waiting list page by clicking the link below. On with the episode. It's brilliant to have with me back on the podcast, Dr. Nick Kendrew. Nick, welcome back. Hi, thanks for having me back. Oh, it's good (laughs) to see you. This is what, number three, third time on? It is number three. It's been a while though, hasn't it? Um, I suppose we've both been quite busy, haven't we? We've been trying to get this in the diary for a while. Yeah, um, you're a difficult man to pin down. (laughs) It's been said before, <laughs> but thanks for having me. <laughs> you're welcome, and actually, we have well and truly managed to pin you down because you're in quarantine. Is that right? This is absolutely right. I'm going slightly stir crazy. So I've been in quarantine now um, for nearly a week. I flew out to Spain to see my other half um, on the 25th of July, and literally, as I was in the air, they changed the rules on quarantine. But originally, it was the healthcare professionals would be exempt from it. So I thought, okay, don't need to come back early, anything. And then, literally, on the day I was coming back, they changed the rules again for healthcare professionals saying so you had to quarantine. So here I am. Um, so I've been working from home and triaging and stuff. So it's been quite luckily, I've got an encrypted laptop. So the technology's there of a fashion. It does tend to crash quite a lot. Um, but I can heartily say that I don't recommend trying to be duty doctor remotely. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really do much for your stress levels. It's pretty hideous. So yes, that was my learning point for the week. <laughs> it was funny you were saying earlier that people were knocking on your door thinking you just weren't answering. It says something about how busy you are as duty doctor when people, you know, don't expect to see you because you're so busy in the surgery and haven't even realised that you're not there. <laughs> exactly, and they're just knocking. What's Nick doing? It's very quiet in there. <laughs> so, He's yes. been really rude today. He's I know, really ignoring He's, us. Well, at what, one point I was being asked to, to speak to one of the um, the district nurses. And I said, I'm really sorry, I can't do that. 
Um, and they're like, well, why not? Everybody else is, is out. And I said, well, I'm actually not in the building. Um, and they went, oh. And so I had to send the message. I thought people had been told. So I had to send the message out saying, just so everybody's aware, I am working from home because I'm in quarantine, blah, blah, blah. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, no, we know. So I think maybe the message just hasn't got round to everybody. So it was um, quite a stressful morning, that one. But it's okay. Yeah. I'm not doing it now. <laughs> oh well anyway it's good it's good that you managed to make some time in quarantine to come back on the podcast yeah. and for, for those of our listeners who haven't encountered Nick before Nick I think you were, were you our first ever episode or you were in the first I three was definitely. episode one were you episode one yeah, yeah. yeah. and that episode's one. really <laughs> popular it's called when doctors get ill and, and you were really sort of open and honest about you know health issues and how you might have managed them differently with a bit of hindsight and Mm -hmm. a bit more self-care perhaps and then you've come on for a self-help book club haven't you and so we were going to do number two self-help book club today because again that was a really popular episode but but first of all for listeners that don't know you Nick just just tell us a little bit about yourself so I am a GP uh, down in Kent. I'm a trainer and a partner. I um, would have said I work eight sessions a week, but as of July, I now work six sessions a week in general practice. I also, yay, and that was basically Rachel making me do that. So thanks, Rach. <laughs> um, finally, it's come to fruition. And I, my other time, I actually work for Red Whale um, as a presenter for their GP update course and also their webinars. We launched our live deep dive webinars last year and having started off from just a germ of an idea they kind of went a bit mad and a bit stratospheric and have been really successful and we actually won the deep dive sort of webinars won the what was it the webinar that rocked 2019 which is from on 24 which is the webinar um content streaming service so we were up against quite big companies and it was just amazing and in fact it was it was a really lovely day because i literally just been in hospital <laughs> and again this is about you couldn't write this so, and Rachel has something to say about this I'm sure so I um, was gearing up to do another webinar and I was duty doctor and <laughs> felt quite unwell that morning and to the point where because I'd been having a few heart problems I was being investigated for stuff and my cardiologist had prescribed me some GTN um, and I, w- I was taking tablets if I needed them because I prefer to do that and spit it out rather than do the spray and get a terrible headache and feel lightheaded and stuff and so that morning I just didn't feel right and I was searching the house for the up-to-date bottle of GTN tablets but again wasn't thinking this isn't quite right and then as I left the house I was thinking this nausea I'm having this feels I wonder that's like cardiac nausea but no chest pain as such Um, and then I got to work I literally got out of the car being duty doctor and as I was walking from my car just a short way across the car park into the building I, I literally couldn't breathe and I just felt like I was just really faint and felt awful and had this terrible pressure on my chest and I went over to the lead receptionist and she said what what on earth's the matter and I I couldn't speak I was so it was like this ridiculous comedy show where I was trying to mime what the problem was and I was going it's my heart (laughs) and she was like oh my god and so she phoned an ambulance and they took me into one of the treatment rooms did an ECG and our paramedic came in and looked at the ECG and she went you're in fast AF I was like, whoa. Um, so anyway, I was taking the hospital in fast AF, running at about 170, feeling a bit rubbish. And I was in recess and this was on a Tuesday and we meant to be doing the webinar on the Thursday. And I was messaging um, one of our team and going, you know, I'll be fine. I'll be out later on today. I'll be doing the, the webinar on Thursday. <laughs> what was I thinking? And they were going, I think you need to have a bit of a rest, Nick. They were completely right. Um, but it hadn't even crossed my mind that I should maybe have a bit of time off. <laughs> but in the end, I ended up having two weeks off work. And the consultant who was looking after me wouldn't let me leave the hospital without a, a Med 3. And we know how unusual it is for them to write Med 3. So he'd written a Med 3 for me to have to have two weeks off just before Christmas. So I felt really guilty. But there we are. It was necessary. I find that hilarious. So you were actually texting people from <laughs> recess, Nick. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Have I taught you nothing? <laughs> no. What? Well, yes. I. I. Uh, I feel I should apologise. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bad. Bad boy. Yes. Bad very boy. bad. But literally, I was in there just going la la la. You know, I'd just do this and that and the other. So um, yes. Oh dear. Yeah. Oh. Well, are you well now? I'm fine. I'm all good, mm. and I'm on the right medication. In fact, do you know what? This has been a huge blessing in disguise because, and it will become relevant to the book we're going to talk about actually. Mm. But I was to the point, before this happened, I could literally, I couldn't walk up the stairs in my house with my washing basket full because I would have to stop because I was getting chest pain and shortness of breath. 
and they couldn't tell me really what the problem was and it was getting worse and worse and bearing in mind that literally a year before I'd, ri- I'd run a half marathon you know something pretty funny was going on but now um on the right medication with the right diagnosis I'm actually back to running um I I did a few weeks ago I did my first 10k for probably about two years slowly but doing it and it feels fantastic and I feel like I'm back you know at least I'm able to exercise and I can see an improvement whereas before I was literally it was like running against a brick wall that it just wouldn't there's just something I knew there was something wrong but nobody could tell me what so yeah so it's been a huge blessing in disguise and things are brilliant at the moment so thank you I'm so glad you're feeling better. I'm so glad you're even feeling better than before that. Yeah. But Nick, I have a question. So it's mm-hmm. going slightly off our topic okay. stuff up, but group, but you're here mm-hmm. anyway. So yeah. why is it that you think at that point when you were in recess, you weren't thinking, crumbs, I need to take a break. I need to sort myself out. I need to get better. Why was it you think your, your first thoughts were about all the responsibilities that you had? I think there is a part of me that was probably in denial you know, this is fine. It's good. And I kind of had to tell myself that this is going to be fine because I didn't really want to bother anybody because for lots of different reasons, but I just didn't want to kind of burden people. And I was thinking about the, you know, work would have been busy for everybody. And, you know, I, bearing in mind, I just, I was duty doctor and I'd just been carted off in an ambulance. And it's a different level of guilt and shame and embarrassment to be carted off <laughs> in front of a queue of patients who are waiting to see you but you know they everybody at work pulled together and and it was absolutely fine but I think from your perspective you're kind of thinking oh my goodness I'm gonna let all these people down but of course the the, the slight issue of being in recess before you mention somebody's name actually takes a lot of <laughs> pressure off the situation for them so <laughs> so I should have probably just thought oh, you know mm-hmm. let nature take its course but, yeah. but it was yeah it's that combination of, yeah, like you said, a bit of denial. And I think sometimes, you know, especially doctors, other professionals who are used to performing at a very high level, used to just not ever really getting ill. Or if you are ill, you know, you don't bother taking time off because you get, you're OK. As we get older, this sort of denial of actually stuff does happen. And even if you mm. have been looking after yourself really well, you still get ill. You can't ever prevent some of this stuff that comes from out of the blue, can you? Yeah, and also, interestingly, even if... I mean, I, I'd been trying to get to the bottom of this with my heart for quite a long time, um, probably a best part of 18 months or more. And so I hadn't kind of been bad about it and thought, oh, I'm just going to just ignore it and not do anything about it. So I had been properly investigated. And even then, it hadn't kind of got given me the answers something like this needed to happen to get an answer and suddenly it all fell into place and it all made perfect sense um you know i'd I'd had numerous um halter monitors worn worn one for a whole week and it hadn't thrown anything up um i'd had two cardiac mris i have to say i would not recommend that to anyone it (laughs) takes it takes claustrophobia to a whole new level wow Um, and i was in the machine for about it was i think 90 minutes or one of them (sighs) Mm. yeah so yeah and, and and all of that and in fact I mean it, it kept on throwing up little things and um, so so the first one I had I got an email from my consultant one afternoon saying that it looks like there's a suggestion that you might have had a small MI mm. that's heart attack for listeners that, that yeah yeah my cardiac yeah. infarction exactly and I, you know I, so this was probably a couple of years ago now and it was actually it, it was in August as well and I remember it, the day that I was meant to be doing it it was a Thursday and I was meant to be filming that afternoon and I just got the email and I just sat there just crying because you know when you're in your whew, in your early 40s you don't expect that kind of information to come through and it kind of you know it really knocks you for six and suddenly you don't feel invincible anymore and you've got all these things to think about and you think wow what's going on and and nobody could tell me what that meant and and you know a suggestion of what does that mean and interestingly I didn't film that afternoon (laughs) but I filmed a couple of days later and I suppose that shows self-care sometimes you you need to take a step back and not Mm -hmm go on with your plans to do filming if you're in a bit of a mess but yeah so I finally you know they, they looked into it all and and nothing came up and then this happened and then they got the diagnosis so yeah but and and in fact they now think maybe I haven't had an MI so we, uh, goodness knows what's going on so it's <laughs> it's all a bit 
up in the air still. But the most important thing is that you know you have on the right medication now. I feel so much better, um, and that's that's important. So, hooray! And looking mm-hmm. back, if you had a friend in exactly the same situation, what would the one piece of advice be that you give to them? What for the whole process, or at one particular? Well, you know, if you think actually there was one thing that would have been better if I'd done that differently, or you know, what would you have done differently? That's a really good question. I think maybe if you know that something's not right, we we know our body's best, and this is talking yeah. to people as patients and as doctors. Where you know we we all get unwell, mm. and we all know our body's best. And if we still feel unwell without a diagnosis, then we should share that with with people looking after us and you know sometimes you have symptoms that don't have any physical explanation and that's that's absolutely fine but then if you have that diagnosis you need to work through it and deal with it too but it's just being in that situation so you know I feel vindicated having had the the drama of recess and everything but equally if it hadn't been that you know I would have liked to have been in a situation where I could have um rather than everything being a bit ambiguous of being able to you know work with what I was given at the end of the day if that makes sense so you know events overtook it and it worked out fine but I'm sure there are people where that maybe didn't happen and they'd be left wondering so you know if you don't feel that you've been given your diagnosis or something then it'd be it's worthwhile just you know going back and chatting basically and I think sometimes as you know it, some of the listeners are doctors and healthcare professionals we diagnose ourselves and then mm. we think well if I went to see a doctor they'd only say this to me yeah and I've you know I've been guilty of that quite recently I've been in quite a lot of pain in my back I thought well uh, if I go and see them they'll only say this and they'll only say say that but actually when I have seen someone they've come up with something different that I hadn't thought of already it's very yeah. hard so you know we, we just think oh no, no one's going to be interested or this is what I do with that patient and we don't give ourselves the benefit of actually properly being patients exactly and I think you know we need to be good patients and you know second guessing is something that we're always going to do but sometimes you just need to and it's it's, so I think it's sometimes it's it's us trying to be in control of the situation isn't it and it's it's handing over and just saying you know I'm not the doctor here you you're the doctor I'm the patient and I trust you and can we you know have that dialogue together to get to move it forward um yeah but it must be a nightmare being as we know <laughs> being a doctor to another doctor is not easy <laughs> yeah. absolutely and I think the other thing that you said as well that I think is really important not just for doctors but any lawyers or nurses managers anyone listening to this is this feeling of I'm indispensable therefore yeah I've got to carry on and I, and I can't I can't be ill I remember when we moved house a couple of years ago and i just exhausted I gave myself pneumonia I could I was sort of crawling up the stairs on my hands and knees <laughs> and then eventually I got a chest x-ray and they said right put me on antibiotics but I had a training course you know that a couple of days time people were flying in from different countries to come to this training course and I felt so bad I said I've got to do it and I I phoned them up I said look I've got this dilemma in that yeah. I've got pneumonia and they're like no way we'll cancel it it's absolutely fine and you know for them it wasn't you know yes it was inconvenient but mm. I was thinking there's no way I can cancel this so you know yeah. I just and I think you know we think oh, there's no way I can cancel a, a duty Dr Dale or there's no way I can mm. do that actually people manage <laughs> yeah and that's you know when I wasn't well everything all I could think of was I'm duty doctor I'm duty doctor I'm duty doctor whereas quite honestly people were stepping over my body and just saying can I have an appointment <laughs> <laughs> quite like that but that's what it felt as <laughs> nobody yeah. really bothered they just wanted to see somebody so <laughs> yeah so it's funny I think you know yes yes we're what we do is important but nobody is indispensable and actually exactly. if, you, if you're not looking after yourself then you're going you're going to be off sick for much much longer and that's not going to be good for anybody not least our patients and our clients and our customers and our families absolutely so that was a little bit of a diversion, wasn't it? <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It Luke. was, right? Then we've gone around the scenic more. route. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but tell us... Yeah, it so- is, actually. And, and interestingly... Uh, so I was just going to say that, interestingly, on episode one, because um, this all kicked off, you know, around the time, and I was going to talk about it then, but it was so raw, I wouldn't have got mm. through it at all. So I talked about something from the past. So so this has kind of been bubbling up for a little while. Um, yeah. But maybe, you know... There's a, there's a whole different podcast in that, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. But you said this book that we were going to talk mm. about has actually been quite helpful in terms of your recovery and stuff. So, yeah. Absolutely. What, tell us so about it. This is Jog On 
by Bella Mackey. Yep. Um, and it's just brilliant. Um, it's such a, an honest, heartfelt book. And basically, she wrote it when she, she'd she been going through a breakup um, and her husband had just walked out on her. And she'd suffered for forever since she was a very young kid with really bad anxiety. And she had never really been into exercise at all. It had always been something that, that had not appealed slash scared and she talks so it takes a lot of time talking about why there's almost like a toxic culture about why exercise isn't appealing to lots of people you either fit the ideal of looking like the poster person in which case you might end up doing exercise but if you don't fit that very strict criteria then you may well not exercise and it's you know it's talking about how we can be more appealing for exercise in general for people but she one day just went out of the house having been crippled with just severe anxiety and she found a really quiet little alley near her house and she just ran not very far and she was desperately scared that somebody might see her but she ran and that was the very first time and then she went back um, every day and, and gradually got better and better and went further and further and then went out of the alley and went out until she lived in London and she you know ended up down the line running finding herself running through Camden and Camden Market a place that she hadn't been in many years because she'd been so terrified about getting out there and there's one beautiful amazing sequence in there where she talks probably about maybe three quarters of the way through the book she talks about um, running along the Millennium Bridge and suddenly she paused on the bridge and she looked around and she was just aware of what a wonderful city she lived in and because she'd been so anxious for so long and she hadn't been on the, like the tube for I think it was like 15 years because she would with anxiety, the way that she was controlling it was was by shutting down those avenues, and then suddenly she was trapped in a cage. And she just gives this beautiful kind of dialogue about how you feel that you've been freed. And yeah, and, and it's just such a, a well written book, and it, and it goes into all the detail of all the different kinds of anxiety. And it's really important that you have the right anxiety diagnosed because the treatments are different. And she talks all about that different treatments. It's very well researched. It's got fantastic resources in it to the point whereby I, I've actually looked in the back of the book to be able to tell a patient a website, which is so it's, you know, it's, it's that good the way that it's been referenced. But it, it kind of makes you look and, and think about why you run in the first place. And Bella was running because of her anxiety and it's really, really helped her with that. And it kind of made me think because I had to reframe why I run because, you know, originally I was running because I liked it and I was you know, doing half marathons and stuff. And then when my heart was playing up, I couldn't, I, I mean, it was like, it was like, I remember saying to a friend, it's like watching a wounded animal. It's just embarrassing now. I could barely, and I used to time, I could barely run 30 seconds without having to stop, having been able to run for, you know, like two hours or so. And in a way, because I didn't give up, I would still drag myself out and I would end up kind of doing almost like hit training. So I'd run for as long as I could. So 30 seconds, then stop and then run a bit more. Um, because that's all I could do but I still managed to do it every now and again and it was I'd say it was soul destroying but what I discovered a bit like what Bella Mackey was talking about in in her book but I also discovered mindful running um, which I found completely reframes the whole thing and, and I think in many ways kind of saw me through and there's some really good mindful running sort of guided runs on the Headspace app and there's also a few books out there about mindful running and it just takes the pressure off completely. It actually means you're not running for any length of time or for any speed or, for, you know, trying to get your personal best. It just basically talks about enjoying being out there and just feeling the sensation of your, your feet on the ground and just focusing on that. And it was so liberating to do that from my perspective. So, yeah, and, and it's interesting because it also made, it's been quite a difficult read for me <laughs> um, because it also made me remember why I started running in the first place. In, in the book, Bella Mackey talks about the fact that, that she started running um, when a relationship broke down. And, and for me, it was similar. So back then, I, I didn't realise at the time, but I know now that I was in a, an abusive relationship. And I remember being out for dinner with some friends and we were talking and they were saying oh they'd love to do like the the half marathon in London and I said oh I, you know I'd love to do that I've always wanted I've only fancied doing the marathon but you know I don't think I'm anywhere near that but I'd love to give it a go and I just really I like the idea of the training and the discipline and all that kind of stuff and the person I was going out with at the time was just just started laughing hysterically and I'm thinking 
you know, I don't think I've said anything particularly funny what's going on. Literally rolling on the floor laughing, like pointing at me, just laughing. And I just, you, you can't run. What, what are you talking about? What, you, what, you know, and literally berating me and just going, you, you, you know, you're not a runner. This is not your thing. Telling me what I can and can't do. And what was brilliant for me was that it made me realise that this isn't right. This, you know, nobody mm. should kind of treat you like that. And something inside me flicked. And I was like, well, do you know what? Nobody tells me what I can and can't do. If I want to run, I'm going to damn well do it. And, I, and that's when I started running. And I did a half marathon um, within, you know, six months or so. Uh, it wasn't the fastest half marathon, but the fact that I did it mm. and the whole discipline of actually was get I, I downloaded a, I think it was a 12 week program just a really basic one for beginners and I was following that religiously because I had no idea about running and I was following it you know started off like 3k in the morning and I was doing every I think it was five days on and two days off in the week and you did a long run on a Sunday and I followed it I didn't miss one training session in 12 weeks and and it was a huge sense of achievement and it got me through the whole breakup thing and it was bizarre is that you'd think that if you leave a, a, an abusive relationship that you actually are happy and you you know feel relieved and oh thank goodness I've escaped it's none of that at all because you're so entwined in the whole thing you do it's like it's like any other breakup you you know you grieve for it and everything and until you realize what's been going on and you know I, I have to say you've got to look at the positives and I have learned so much from that experience and the other thing that I didn't know anything about until I uh, around the time of the breakup I, I remember typing I was, I was googling you know how can somebody <laughs> how can somebody dump you over the phone after no sorry by text message after you know blah 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 and suddenly all this stuff about narcissists came up and wow and I started looking it up and, and there's a thing I found which was basically the stages of a narcissistic relationship and it's like a textbook of what happened. And when you start dating a narcissist, they put you on this massive pedestal to start with. And it's like being in this romantic movie. And there's almost like this fireworks and it's just this most wonderful thing. And, um, you know, you cannot do anything wrong. And it feels really uncomfortable because somebody's showering you with compliments. You kind of think, mm, feels uncomfortable. But I remember thinking, actually, do you know what? I've, you know, I've, I've had a you know, tough time. Let's just go with it it's actually quite nice to have compliments. So I kind of went with it for a bit. And within, you know, a few months, I was told that um, they wanted to marry me. And, but, and I remember thinking, oh, I feel a little bit uncomfortable, but, but go with it. This, you know, this is all nice stuff. And then the thing that they do when they've got you on the pedestal and you start to believe the nice things they say, their sport is to knock you right off it. It's like pulling the rug from under you. And it's, they get off on it. And it's really, really damaging and difficult. And, and the only advice that anybody's... Give, gives about this kind of thing. A, if you know that you're in one, do not confront them. It's a bit like, have you ever saw the trailers for Killing Eve on the BBC? In the very first season, there's a bit when, when it says, um, what should you never say to a psychopath? Never tell them they're a psychopath because it upsets them. It's the same with the narcissist. You never <laughs> okay. tell them. And literally, mm. and you just run. You just get out of it and you go and never look back is the advice. It's difficult mm. to do, but it's, yeah. And, and it's terrifying looking at how how textbook it can be Gosh. yeah so that's kind of all linked in with why I run yeah. <laughs> so you can imagine it's been quite a quite a journey to read that book <laughs> that is I, I hear so often people that took up running for a reason so mm. often it's you know they've had a cancer diagnosis they've been through chemo they want to get fit and it, it's been this thing for them or like you said getting over a, a really difficult relationship and a, a sort of therapy and I, I, I was doing a podcast with Ebony Allard recently called I think it was called how to be an adult and she talks about running as she talks about it oh that that movement and meditation that lots of people do oh it's called jogging I was like yeah oh I'd never thought of it like that because I think a lot of people do it in a very driven way like I've got to get these times I've got to, and, and that can be quite stressful but if it's just about having your body moving in a way that is really feels good and mostly you're outdoors aren't you unless unless you have to sit on a treadmill which is good for the soul as well but it's about I guess it's about the attitude that you do it in absolutely and I think this this is the, the maybe the problem why people don't run is that they feel they have to do it in a certain time they have to get the personal best they you know you've got to go on one of these apps where they're ranked against everybody else but yeah the, the thing that really freed it for me was the whole thing about 
about t- reframing it and doing it into into mindful running where you as you say you, you focus on the movement you focus on the the breeze on your face you look at the sky and, the, and appreciate your surroundings and all that stuff is so important and if you can't run for physical reasons then you can also do mindful walking which is a similar principle and it's all about it's about you know the movement of your feet and the, the pressure of your feet on the ground and all that kind of stuff and th- there are some some guided mindful walks on apps as well which are hugely beneficial and I was doing some of those when I couldn't run properly. So it's it's a it's a kind of finding what suits you and and not being bound by this kind of cliche that you have to be dressed in lycra and <laughs> running your fastest and you know and, and there's there's also no right way to run. There's ways that people have kind of there's a consensus as to what might be best, but but nobody can say this is the perfect running technique because it's there isn't one which is quite liberating to know as well. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's really interesting what you say about doing it just for the sake of doing it rather than ach- achieving a goal. So I can't really run because it really does my back in, but I've got a road bike, which I've been going yeah. out on. And, and um, I've really started enjoying it recently. And I think it's because of a mindset shift because before I'd like, right, I've got to go really fast. I've got to get a really good workout. I've got this Garmin that tells me how fast I've been and how many yeah. calories I've burned. And and during lockdown, it was sort of stopping me doing it. I thought, you know what? I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just mm. going to go on a route that I like and not bother about whether I've had a good workout or not. And so exactly. that's just got me over the hurdle of, oh, I can't be bothered to wear out. So I'll get on my bike and I'll just cycle and I won't worry mm. about going too fast, but then I'll easily cycle for an hour and I get back and you do look at it. It's like, well, that's been a really good workout, but I it's just changed it and I'm thinking about things as I go along and it, it's one of my most creative times mm. actually because I'm out and I, this sort of repetitive repetitive movement you're yeah. not having to concentrate on anything really you can just mm. sort of go it's that's been a real I, I've begun to realize why why joggers like it so much and why long distance cyclists like it I, before I was always my ex I was like doing classes at the gym or something like that but yeah yeah, and, and I think I'm pretty sure that Headspace has got a, a guided mindful cycle on it too. Oh, um, really? I think so. I yeah. could be completely wrong. But yeah, again, that I would certainly recommend that because it just gets you in the right mindset and it just mm-hmm. takes the pressure off. And it's about, again, it's about living in the moment. And there's nothing better than living in the moment if you're cycling a bike or running or walking or whatever because it, it just adds that extra dimension to it. And the whole thing about mindful movement is, is just, it, it makes it, I think it helps you to, it ingrains it better in because it makes it more grounded doesn't it It makes it more now Mm. i think so i yeah i can't recommend it enough and i think it's definitely seen me through and in fact the current challenge in quarantine has been the fact that i can't go for a walk i can't go for a run and I'm so, to stop myself from going stir crazy, I've, I've um, downloaded Joe Wick's, his, <laughs> his, he's the got kids a one. No, 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 there's, there's one for adults and it's his hit exercise. It's a, you can get it and okay. um, it's like a DVD or a, you can, I can buy yeah. the video side of it. So it's not one of his YouTube things that he's finished now. It's, yeah, it's, and it's, I'm on level one, but it's just brilliant because, I mean, I'm, I've got muscles that are aching that I've never even known that they had muscles there. Well, I should know really being a doctor, but you know what I mean? It's kind of like, you know, aches and pains. It's like, wow, what's going on there? But, but for me, yes, the physical side of it is important. But the, the other side is the mental mental well-being has been so important because otherwise I would be literally going mad, I think, in here because there's, you know, everything can just get blown out of proportion when you're in a in an enclosed space so it's so important to, to have that release and do some kind of exercise so that's been my yeah. salvation the man's a hero i say <laughs> you should get yeah. a knighthood <laughs> uh, he, he has been brilliant my my daughter's been doing the little joe wicks workout well when she was sort of home schooled so yeah that that's been really good and for me during lots time just the power of exercise has been really it's really blown my mind actually I think because I live in Cambridge so we cycle around quite a lot so even taking my children to school it's a half an hour cycle 50 minutes there 50 minutes home so I think I was naturally getting quite a lot of exercise and in lockdown you know and and it really started to affect me and I'd feel so grumpy but then I'd know actually if I just went and did a either out my bike or even if it's at home I have a friend who's just been absolutely brilliant in giving us regular circuit training just to do a circuit training on, on my roof terrace <laughs> with you know <laughs> press-ups on the railings and stuff like that it's just it completely changes my mood and I've just got to take that learning as we start to yeah you know go and it, forward 
and we mustn't forget that and because i think as we get busier it's probably the first thing that gets dropped off the list of things that we do and i think i mean with the joe wick stuff 15 minutes i mean yes you've got to do the warm-up and you've got to do the cool down as well but and he keeps saying you, you know even you're if you're busy you can still fit this into your your busy regime and he is absolutely right and, and you know we make time to clean our teeth we make time to have a shower we need to make it that important that as a maybe not every single day but he's talked about five days a week that we do that kind of thing just to because it's so important for our mental health and our physical health yeah i mean i bet everyone can find 15 minutes a day to scroll through social media perhaps <laughs> I'm sure they can. <laughs> yeah, there's a really good video actually. We'll put it in the show notes by Dr. West. I can't remember his. I think it's Michael West. Uh, anyway, have a look in the show notes. It's called 23 and a half hours and it's on YouTube. And mm-hmm. it's a really good video to send out to patients or or friends or family and it's just a little animation about the benefits of exercise and and they he basically saying that there is one intervention that reduces depression reduces heart disease reduces strokes reduces anxiety you know it's and it's free <laughs> you know there's yeah. if i could give you a one pill that did that we'd all be wanting it wouldn't we but actually and he says you know you've got 24 four hours in the day and spend 23 and a half day um half hours prone lying on the couch that's fine just for half an hour get up and move around Absolutely. and he gives you know he gives all the the studies you know about the bus drivers and the versus the conductors and the conductors had a much lower death rate than the bus drivers because they were up and down and moving around and stuff mm-hmm. like that so it, it's a really good video and it really sort of changed my attitude it's like yeah even if it's just walking walking around a bit you know that's helpful even if it's just a 15 minute joe wicks video <laughs> yeah and that's what I'm going to have to do for the next 10 days or so. Uh, but I suspect that I might end up doing it a bit more as well. But I, I cannot wait to get my running shoes on and get back out yeah, there. Um, it's, oh, man, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you say your three main sort of learning points are from that jog on book? OK, so I would say that, first of all, it's important to realise that we're all individuals and we all will find our own version of running um so it might not be running it might be walking it might be cycling Cycling. yeah yeah, exactly but it's going to be something that that we can do but we need to whatever we whatever we get when we find it we need to make time for it because we need to realize how important it can be and in jog on it's what's so amazing to see and she you know she talks about that she does it you know she she runs pretty much every day and she now every city that she's been to in the world she's she's running it and this is somebody that didn't used to do any exercise at all but it's because she and she's not doing it because she wants to look a certain shape or anything she's doing it for her mental health and I think that's a huge message and you know it can be so sort of all-encompassing you know if you look at social media now and you, you look at my Instagram timeline it's full of people you know working out and selfies in the gym and you know completely ripped completely unobtainable we don't know what's going on behind the scenes but I suspect they're not all all smiley faces all the time and it must be a real struggle to maintain that kind of persona and that exterior shall we say if that's your main source of income and all that kind of stuff so it must be it must be tough so I'm not having a go at them at all but what I'm saying is that that we are bombarded with these images and we need to realize that it's it's not real (laughs) Maybe we should be much more aware of social media and maybe limit our time on it much more than it. I, su- I suspect in years to come, I think we're probably there now that it, it is being seen as quite a toxic thing. So we need yeah. to be aware of that toxicity, you know, and find our own reason for exercising, which does not necessarily mean to be that we need to get a six pack. Yeah. We need to, you know, think about our mental health and, and how it can benefit us. And I remember when I was training for my very first half marathon, I was meant to be, in fact, I was, I was doing a locum um, and it was in a surgery so it was a surgery that I, I think I've been to one or two times before and it was the it was the Tuesday after the August bank holiday and on that morning the he practice manager phoned me and say um just to let you know that the other doctor has just phoned in sick so you're by yourself I remember thinking Eek. <laughs> exactly now <laughs> <laughs> now I've been uh, for a run for that morning listeners, already. That is like the busiest day of the year. Any any yeah. days after a bank holiday nightmare. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. It's you just rammed the rafters yeah. with with phone calls and patients and everything. But because I've been doing, I've been actually been for a run that morning. I just I was like, okay, that's fine. I can see one patient at a time. You know, I, it's actually not my practice, so it's actually not really my problem. They will have to look at the demand and everything else. Um, I will go in and do my job, and that's all I can do. And it felt 
really lovely to actually not be at the point where I'd be sitting under the desk rocking gently when I was thinking, ah, what am I going to do? And that was 100%. That was because I'd just done a run that morning and I was in the middle of a training program. Um, and it just goes to show how if you've burnt off all that adrenaline kind of before you go into work, that your mind is in a different place and you kind of look for solutions rather than just focusing on, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. You know, so it's actually really... It was, it was a lovely thing to actually experience firsthand. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it does make a, it does make a huge difference to the day. Yeah, if I manage to get out and exercise before I do anything as opposed to at the end. And I think and the other thing is, I know we've talked about tiny habits before with Catherine Hickman on the podcast. BJ Fogg has released a book all about how to change habits. And the main problem people have with trying to change their habits is they do they try and do that things for the wrong reasons that habits will stick if they make you feel good yeah so if you're doing exercise because it makes you feel good that will stick if you're doing it because you want a really ripped body or you want to lose weight or whatever that's probably not going to stick but it's it's how you feel when you do it so people who are listening if you want to up your exercise find something that makes you feel good don't do something that you hate doing because you're never ever going to carry on with it are you exactly and i think we should all remember that and and the other thing is there's um, particularly there's a guy that i think it's called jay alderton that i follow on instagram he's a personal trainer and he recently posted up a picture of him looking absolutely ripped you know six pack more muscles than you've ever seen in your life when he was bodybuilding basically cut to a picture of him today where he still looks very fit however not in the same league as the completely you know everything bulging shall we say <laughs> and <laughs> he basically said the picture on the left where I was at the top of my game I was so miserable because I, you know literally I, I had to watch everything that passed my lips like you know I couldn't eat anything that, that wasn't cleared by my trainer and x y and z and I you know every and I was never happy with how I looked and I could always be better and you know there's always somebody snapping at my heels and x y and z so you know these people who you might look at them and think oh I really want to be like that there's so much more to it than just the photograph and and we need to remember that sometimes and take a step back and just go hmm there's more to it so yeah great yeah brilliant nick i'm afraid we're out of time so where can people find you if they'd like to get in touch with you right so um i would be probably best places on twitter i am at nick kendry that's at n-i-k-k-e-n-d-r-e-w and i will um, you know i often tweet stuff that i'm working on so all summer i was tweeting about red whale class and um, which was mm -hmm. the the webinar series we we're doing for gp trainees which was brilliant fun and you came on it and you were brilliant too so <laughs> so yeah that's where i am at the moment brilliant um, so that's great. And so, Nick, will you, will you come back again, do another self-help book group? I will. We'll see what, what things that throws up for us <laughs> next time. We'll have to, have to oh. select it carefully. <laughs> yeah, it's been such a pleasure having you on. And just thank you for sharing all that and for your honesty and, oh, and being vulnerable you. and all, all that sort of stuff. So it's been really great chatting. Well, thanks for having me. Bye. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please share it with your friends and colleagues. Please subscribe to my You Are Not A Frog email list and subscribe to the podcast. And if you have enjoyed it, then please leave me a rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. So keep well, everyone. You're doing a great job. You got this.